I am uh, delighted to be in conversation this afternoon with Laureen Powell Jobs. Uh, Laureen is the founder and director of the Emerson Collective. Mm -hmm. The Emerson Collective is an organization that supports social entrepreneurs who are committed to the ideal that all people should have the opportunity to live to their full potential. Wow. Um, would you like to know who's out here today? Yes. Okay. Well, there is a, a formal. Okay, are, uh, we, are we going to go around the room? And no. no. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't be uh, that, that wouldn't unusual in philanthropy, but we're not going to uh, do that. <laughs> we're not going to do that today. Um, but I am going to ask a, a couple of questions. So, how many of you, just by a show of hands, uh, fund in the area of inequity or access to equal opportunity? Oh, quite a few. And, and how many fund in the area of education? So we have a lot of folks who fund in the area yeah. of education. Can we ask about K-12 education? Sure. Versus higher ed? That's K-12. How about higher ed? So quite a, mm -hmm. quite a few in Kinda each. Kind of half and half, yeah. So you began your journey to impact, as it were, in the area of education mm -hmm. in uh, East Palo Alto, right? Not too far yes. from here. So yes. can you tell us a little bit about yeah, how that got sure. started? Well, um, well, the genesis of my awakening into the social sector was that when I was running Terra Vera, the natural foods company, I was asked by a friend of mine named Carlos Watson, who I met in graduate school, to, to come with him to speak at a local high school called Carlmont High School, um, to speak to students from East Palo Alto who were, who were seniors. This was the beginning of their senior year. And they had been in a four-year curriculum course at Carlmont High School called AVID that was to prepare them to be college ready. Uh, and there were 35 students in the class, and we were asked to just come and talk about college and talk about life after college. It was sort of one of those, you know, go volunteer for an hour in, in a local high school. And since I hadn't been to a high school in California, um, since I grew up on the East Coast, I had never been to one. I was enthusiastic and wanted to meet high school students from EPA. So we do have a clip, yes. <laughs> right, of the yeah, College Track we do. Uh, program, and I wonder if we could, uh, could run it now. And I have friends that sometimes they say, I'm going to drop out during high school. I'm like, why would you want to drop out when you can make your life so much better? I am a College Track alumni from the East Palo Alto site, and I am now an Oakland teacher fighting for my students. There's hope. There's always hope especially for someone that is trying to make something of themselves. Uh, my little brother wants to go to Stanford, and uh, if, for, for those things to happen, you know, they need to have that support, they need to have people that believe in them, uh, be surrounded by uh, this, you know, this whole college track atmosphere. College was not even something I actually had in mind before I moved to New Orleans. I didn't even think I was cut out for college. I was the, the guinea pig for our family in the sense of like how to get through high school and how to apply to college so that my younger brother and now my younger cousins can also go through it with my support. Somewhere deep inside you is somebody that wants to succeed, is somebody that wants to become more than what they are right now. I want to go around telling people we can do anything that we set our minds to. Even if it's in a little crowd and I'm only speaking to one person, that one person can pass it on to other people. I want the next generation to see us as the role model because the role models that I had growing up pushed me forward. We're strong role models. So if I'm a strong role model, that means the next generation gets a strong role model. And there comes an even stronger generation, an even stronger generation, so we'll become a generation that changes the world with everything that we do. They gave me the resources that I need to succeed and my grades improved like by a lot. And without that, I'd be struggling so, so much right now. You, just, you don't even know how much these people have helped me. College Track is like my family. They're my blood. I bleed College Track. I think College Track has changed my life. I think it has made me get out there and talk to people and tell them, yes, I'm Chicana, and yes, I don't come from one of the best communities or whatever you want to say, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to call it college. That doesn't mean I'm not going to get into Harvard. That doesn't mean I'm not going to become a lawyer, or maybe even president. That's what it means. College Track gives us the ideas to do those things. I literally feel like College Track is, um, was at that time and still continues to be a lifeline for how I am able to just continue to find success and be able to define that for people still in my community. I'm not just 
some other kid trying to go to college. And I want to be somebody. I want, I want, I want to be somebody that people look at and is like, I want to be like him. I realize that I can be that person. Without College Track, I just would not be here today. Thank you for playing that. Yeah, every time I, I've seen it this four or five times, every time I do, I, uh, I'm moved by it. Yeah, it's really moving to see transformation happen in someone's life, or to, to have the privilege of being an inflection point in someone's life. Yeah, yeah. how are those kids doing? Um, well, some of them are still in high school. Like Leslie is a junior in high school in Boyle Heights. She, the, the, the young woman who opened uh, the video. Um, so Boyle Heights in, in Los Angeles. And then Marlene Castro, who is the teacher in Oakland, mm -hmm. um, is a TFA, she's on the, at the end of her second year as a TFA teacher in Oakland. Mm. So in fact, I'm going to meet with her, I think in, in the next two weeks, mm. she's going to come to the office. She, she, the reason I have a personal relationship with her because every year I, I am the college advisor or counselor for a, a small handful of students. I used to, I used to have a lot of seniors. So a few years, I had all the seniors. I was their college advisor, um, and so this. But these days, I do only one or two students. Yeah. And Marlene was was one of my students, one of my advisees. That's great. So yeah, it's really it's for me. It's one of the great privileges and and joys of my life. Yeah. It seems like your college track experience is part of what led you to uh, uh, a sense of wanting to do more systems change work in education, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and in particular to uh, reimagining high schools. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could talk about that and why high schools? Um, well, interestingly, high school is where we started with college track, uh -huh. and um, they're just, even in the last 16 years of, of the work that we've done, We've seen a lot of energy and funding go into early childhood, early education, mm -hmm. even in the narrowing of gaps in K-8, um, racial and gender and, and socioeconomic achievement gaps. But NAEP scores for the last 17 years among 17-year-olds has been completely flat. And yeah. so there really haven't been any, any gains in outcomes and no narrowing of achievement gap among races and incomes. So, um, so we really need people to be focusing on high schools. High school obviously is, is the last opportunity in our education pipeline to yeah. seriously prepare students so that they're career and college ready and ready to be lifelong learners. And um, I found that often people feel like, well, if we don't get K-8 right, we're not, high school's too late. And we have found that not to be true whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. And so many people, so many young people coming out of high school still need remediation, right, when they get to college, two-year or four-year college. Yes, so, I mean, it, we, we still, even though we're, our graduation rates as a nation have, uh, from high school have improved, we still have, have wide gaps in, wow. in education rates um, among races and income levels, but also what we teach and to whom is yeah. greatly unequal, mm -hmm. and so, uh, for example, um, in low-income communities, only 30% of high schools teach calculus. 30% teach calculus, 40% teach physics. And so just access to, to these classes is not available. And so then if you, you have students who are graduating, the students from low-income communities are far more likely to require remediation. Yeah. So 60% of students going into community colleges in California require remediation, which is, is really just high school extension. Yeah. That means high schools aren't doing their job. Yeah. Nationwide, it's, it's about 40% of all students need remediation. Yeah, that's something. So uh, uh, one of the things that comes through. Well, it's, it's colossal failure. I mean, I, 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 I don't like to always just spout statistics, because right. we could go all day long and talk about 
the degree to which we're failing our students. And every student that you just saw in that video would have been failed because the, their underlying schools have these outcomes. They're not having these outcomes. And so yeah. it's actually so important for us as a, as a country to stop and intervene and change what we're doing and how we do it. You, you have hope that we can change the system. <laughs> well, this, it's, 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 the system is run by people. People uh -huh. actually get to change the circumstances and, and the environments in which we work. Yes, it just requires will. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> um, you're on the board of a few uh, uh, organizations, educational institutions, in addition to Stanford, <laughs> uh, New Schools Venture Fund, mm -hmm. Teach for All. Uh, you invest in a lot of education technology. We uh, do. We do a bit. Uh, yep. So, as you think about all of uh, these different areas, uh, what are you most excited about? What gives you the most hope? Um, <laughs> Well, I actually think that we know a lot now. That gives me hope. We used to, when, when we started College Track, we actually didn't know, we, we had no disaggregated data. So, so, so any high school could say, well, we have 90% we have high school graduation rate, and yet they could have 40% high school graduation rate of African American students and 95% high school graduation rate of their white students, which was often the case. Um, and so now, after No Child Left Behind, as much as, as the, that policy needs to be reformed and rethought, just like a lot of federal policy, that's kind of how it works in our country, um, that policy gave us sunlight and illumination mm -hmm. in areas that, that we had never had it before. So once, once the veil is lifted, then it's up to us to act. Yeah. It's very easy to hide behind the veil if you don't have any, any sunlight in that darkness. Mm -hmm. So that gives me hope. There are a lot of people, I mean, the, the amount of entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs and, and creative, thoughtful people who've moved into the educational sector is astonishing and yeah. wonderful. Yeah. I think Teach for America has done our nation a great, great service in bringing in, in migrating IQ into the sector. They've brought um, extraordinarily thoughtful, energetic, enthusiastic people who, even if only 40% of them stay in the teaching profession, they're informed by their experiences and they go forward as leaders in, in their communities. So that's a great thing. There are some really wonderful, I mean, there, you have so many people who are, who are K-12 funders here, truly wonderful, organizations that if, if they work collectively and collaboratively can work towards, um, towards removing obstacles for all students everywhere. Yeah. Um, I think you know, the, the charter school movement, which is what New Schools Venture Fund was invested in from the very early days, is really exciting too because um, that, I think the high performing charter schools disprove the notion that that poor kids can't learn, that kids who, who come to school who are hobbled by various inequities can't, can't learn at the same rate as other kids, and that's been disproven. Yeah. Thank God. Yeah, yeah. Our son has just signed up to go to a charter school, uh, high school uh, in Menlo Park. Oh, really? Which Summit one? Prep. Summit. Yeah. 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 We're very they're, excited about they that. Have, they have a fantastic model, and they're doing yeah. really well. Yeah. Yeah. So it's through your experience with um, education uh, that you got interested in immigration and sensitized to it. Yes, so, that's right. So tell us a little bit about that journey uh, well, and how that um, happened. In 2001, we had our first, as I, uh, pretty much everything that I've done is in, informed through my own experience and then also through research that, that I read of others' experiences. But this, this particular circumstance of, of students who were brought to this country by their parents from other countries um, called dreamers that, that most people uh, recognize as, as sort of in this, in this purgatory of uh, this legal miasma of having, having no legal standing in our country um, affects 20% of college track students. So in mm -hmm. our first year of, of having high school graduates who were applying to college, we had five out of the 27 who were undocumented. Mm. And I didn't, this was 2001, I didn't know what that meant. 
Um, and so we, we went and talked to their parents and we found that they had brought, been brought to the country illegally as infants and toddlers. And the none of the students knew about the circumstances of their birth and the fact that they weren't, um, that they weren't American citizens. Yeah. And we found out very quickly that because they, ha they have no legal standing in this country, they have legal standing in the country of their birth, so they're treated as international students, so they can't access any state or federal funding for mm. their education. Mm. Um, and so, so is that a, a de facto uh, wall? It's from a wall. Yeah. It's a wall. Because every, every single family is low income, and if you have to pay yeah. uh, full tuition and full room and board, it's an unsurmountable, insurmountable wall. Yeah. 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 So then at college, what we did at College Track was um, we found various ways to, to uh, kind of cobble together different scholarships and, and, and some work, st work study programs for credit. And then luckily, California passed in state tuition for Dreamers, which is helpful, but still, you still have quite a big financial hurdle to mm -hmm. overcome. Mm -hmm. um, and you and use the term that. Dreamers. Yes, so, yes. So who, when you say Dreamers, who, do you, who are you referring to? Do, do people not, are people not familiar with the term Dreamers? Well, just I'm, educate us. Oh, okay. Um, well, the, okay, the federal legislation that, uh, that came in front of Congress um, actually in 2001 and 2006 and seven was, and then it was supposed to come up again in uh, 2013, is called the DREAM Act. And the DREAM Act would allow students who are in the circumstance that I described, who were brought to this country at, under the age of 16 by their parents, would be, would be afforded certain um, a, a, an expedited path to citizenship, um, a legaliza a path to legalization that would be immediate, that would allow them to work, to access education, to access some funding for their education, certainly to access a lot of the scholarships that are closed off to them now. Yeah. Um, it's, it, there is widespread bipartisan support, not only in Congress, but actually across the United States, um, we know this because we at Emerson have done polling for the last many years um, to support this across in, in districts, states, and nationally, just to make sure that we do, in fact, have a supermajority of American citizens who support the passage of the DREAM Act and even the extended, ex extended comprehensive immigration reform. Yeah. Um, but as everyone in this room knows, our Congress has not taken any action. Uh, the Senate did, the House didn't. Um, last year, and so we are still, we are still, I think, completely hobbled by a broken immigration system in this country. Right. We have a a, a, a story uh, to share about that. Can we, should we play the clip? Yeah, of Jose? I'll give it a little bit of context. Yeah. So in um, 2013, uh, Emerson Collective uh, partnered with Davis Guggenheim, who is the filmmaker behind Waiting for Superman, and we made a short film about the passage of the DREAM Act, and there were four dreamers who we followed uh, for a number of months and told their story, and then we brought this, we, we uh, premiered the film in the U.S. Capitol, and uh, we screened it for both Republicans and Democrats, and then we brought it around to over 100 college campuses mm -hmm two years ago, because there was a lot of momentum. Um, it's hard to remember even two years ago, and you know, our political climate was very different yeah. from what it is right now, especially for uh, the, the hope for immigration reform. And there was a lot of momentum for both passing the DREAM Act and then all components of comprehensive immigration reform, um, including ag workers and high skill bill and H-1B visa reform and legal legal immigration reform, all of which is sorely needed. Yeah. So this, this is a clip from the film. The Dream is Now. Uh, the Dream is Now. Right. I highly commend uh, the film. We, we did a, a screening of the full uh, film at the Hewlett Foundation, and uh, it was very powerful. So you're only going to get to see uh, a few minuts uh, if you can play it. But it's a 30-minute it's a film, so uh, yeah. I hope you all get to watch well, it Well worth later. the time. When I was in high school, I was fearless. I thought I could do anything. Jose was a top math scholar and dreamt of being a mechanical engineer. This is the picture that made my mom really proud. 
I have all my math, science, engineering books. He was awarded a full scholarship to Arizona State University. I have my diploma over here. It has some dust on it. When Jose graduated in 2011, there was a shortage of mechanical engineers in his state. But he could not apply for the jobs his other classmates were seeking because he was undocumented. Now I'm working in Stuckel. Every day physical labor, um, you do sand, you get the shovels. Heavy work. When you think about it, you realize, hey, I have a degree, I have all this, what am I doing? There's a bargain you make with your family and your teachers, and you believe it. Work hard, do everything right, and it will pay off. But they each hit the same wall. Without citizenship or a social security number, they were stuck in limbo. Experts calculate that giving citizenship to people like Jose will add $329 billion to our economy in additional taxes and spending. I don't have as much enthusiasm as I did before. You can dream all you want, but you're still here. What is Jose doing today? Oh, this is, um, so after we made this film and uh, comprehensive immigration reform failed to uh, even be uh, discussed in the House of Representatives, uh, the president issued an executive action um, and, and declared that childhood arrivals would be, um, would be free from the fear of deportation. So what many of you have heard of DACA, it's Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, which is an, a two-year executive action which gives a reprieve, some, some of the components of the DREAM Act to dreamers. Um, and so, so people like Jose, um, who were dreamers, who were brought here um, under the age of 16 and had never committed a crime and had lived their whole lives in the United States, um, could get provisional work permits and, and be actually employable. But Jose and uh, the other students in the film all qualified and received DACA. Mm -hmm. And he's now teaching math in Phoenix in a high school mm -hmm. through Teach for America. Wow, well, that's a great story. Yeah. It's a good story. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if, if the executive authority, uh, the executive action expires, is not re-upped, or even better, if, if actually Congress could get its act together and pass common sense comprehensive immigration reform, that would, that would resolve things. But he will be imperiled if, if DACA expires and there's no legislative action behind it. Yeah. So is it he risky? Would, he would have to go back into the shadow economy. Uh -huh. so, so that's a good question. Um, and, and a thinking person can come to the same conclusion, which is, of course, it's risky. Right. Because um, in order to receive DACA status, all of the students have to register with with um, INS and Department of Homeland Security, and so now, and they have, and and DHS knows where every single uh, individual right. lives, and so if the action expires, is not re-upped, they have, you know, certainly uh, every state has a list of all the DACA recipients and knows exactly where they live, and um, and we, as a country, have been deporting people at a much accelerated rate over the last six years uh, than we ever have. And so uh, we are, I mean, it's, it's actually quite chilling, the degree to which we are, we are wasting and, and in so many ways, many horrific ways, st uh, kind of stamping on what is beautiful human capital and the economic engine for our country. Yeah, we are a country of immigrants. Yes. I, I wanted to do, ask a little question of the audience. Uh, take a little break here. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I'd like you to, just as a show of hands, 
Um, if you are first generation or second generation or are married or have been married to somebody who's first or second generation, uh, raise your hand. Wow. Okay. Yeah, um, that looks like more than half of this room. Yeah, uh, a good number mm -hmm. of folks in this room. Yeah, and I think uh, it's not a stretch. I mean, even if you, it, so, so for the other half who are, who are probably third and fourth generation, it's not a stretch to imagine, but for the grace of God, that is I. And right. so uh, yeah, the, the degree to which uh, we are so callously disregarding these people who live in our midst um, is, is unconscionable, I think. So, so um, the more people can, can amplify stories, the more that we can hold politicians accountable, the better. How many uh, fund in the area of immigration? Raise your hand. So this is this is interesting. I mean, I think it's worth all of us looking at that. That was a, that, just that's for people a, in the front. There was very few. Yeah, very very few. Yeah. Um, and and it's not as it's not as mature a sector to fund in. It's not as approachable. It's actually there aren't that many um, organizations, you know, national or local organizations, and not a lot of entrepreneurs coming into the sector. Although. Um, what we tend to find um, is that when public policy severely fails, um, entrepreneurs go move into the social sector to, to try either motivated by justice or, or the desire to change. And so we're seeing now um, post failure of any legislative act some very interesting yeah. and, and, um, and creative and effective advocates and activists and entrepreneurs in the immigration sector. So um, if anyone feels particularly moved to find out more about it, I know we can, we can certainly circulate some recommendations, but it's actually not all that hard to find in your own community. Um, part of what is needed is a, a capacity building in the legal services um, at the community level. And so most communities have community legal services and those, those need a lot of capacity building. There's some innovative um, organizations that are just starting up that are bringing fellows mm -hmm. from, from law school and recent college grads into immigration law. Um, there are a couple of organizations that are, that are uh, taking people who are working in law firms, mm -hmm. and, and we have an abundance of them who have a passion for social justice mm -hmm. and training them in immigration law. And, and um, again, giving them fellowships around the country where, where there's a, a dire need for legal services. Yeah. Do you have a, a favorite, uh, a couple of uh, yeah. programs? Yeah. In New York in City, there's Immigrant Justice Corps. Uh, mm -hmm. That's absolutely wonderful, super creative. Um, um, there's EJW, which I'm trying to remember what that acronym stands for. Uh, Equal <laughs> Justice Corps. Or equ e yeah, Equal, Equal Justice, Justice Works. Works. Uh, is EJW. Um, <laughs> those are in the, the capacity building field. Um, also, there are groups like Clinic and Civic and Welcoming America that are all devoted to, um, to both changing, changing local laws and policies, but also yeah. just within community. Oh, there's, oh yeah, there's a whole bunch of them up here. Oh, there they are. Um, in community, the way that Welcoming America works is, is working with civic leaders to, um, to become immigrant friendly and acknowledging that, uh, that immigrants in the United States are the economic engine for growth and making and building bridges and, and breaking down barriers for different groups. Yeah. I mean, there, it makes a lot of sense for cities like Detroit and Dayton to, to be welcoming of, mm -hmm. of industrious, um, hardworking individuals from wherever they come. And considering that's, that's one of our foundational tenets as a country, um, it's, it's hard to believe that more people aren't doing this as, as a strategy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you were telling me about that there are these pop-up clinics, pop-up legal clinics. Uh, yeah, that, that yeah, yeah. Some so of these entrepreneurs are, are, they are, are working on. Yes. Yes. Tell us about uh, that. Well, one of one of the fellows that we fund is this extraordinary individual who has she has a pop up DACA clinic, and uh -huh. so she sort of has this this Toomey suitcase 
that she takes around um, Texas. Um, all of northern Texas is her jurisdiction, and so she goes from community to community where there are no legal services, uh -huh. and she'll set up her DACA clinic, and she'll talk to church leaders, and she'll get uh, groups of individuals who didn't know about uh, about either the the executive action or the pathway to get DACA status, and yeah. so she has single-handedly changed many, many lives. That's great. Yeah. So, there so about there, one point there's a lot of creativity uh -huh. and opportunity in the space. There are about 1.8 million dreamers, I think. That's, that's what I heard, right. read, right, roughly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how successful right. has DACA been at uh, reaching those folks, well, signing think, them up? And I think um, at the latest count, about 800,000 people have received DACA status. So I think it's been extraordinarily yeah. effective. I think we would have seen you know, all two million come forward if, if the risk that you hadn't identified immediately didn't exist. Yeah. I think the second we see legislative action, we're going to have an influx of, of great human capital into yeah. cities all across the country. So what are your lessons so far uh, from the immigration work? I mean, we're in such a polarized time. Mm -hmm. uh, there are these efforts going on that are innovative, entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. uh, but the polarization isn't going away until maybe the Madison Initiative uh, uh, helps uh, yeah. reduce polarization. Uh, I think, um, here, here's what I've learned, that it's actually, polarization is real and I don't think it's necessarily diminishing because of the way that, um, that also, our media has become polarized, uh, and so so people's people's uh, I think biases and and inclinations are reinforced through the media that they consume. But nevertheless, there's no there's no white hat black hat in this. There there no real like the Democrats are not always good and the Republicans are not always bad. It's uh -huh. it's back and forth. Both parties use it as a political football and yeah. have since 2001. So that's not that's. That was a learning for me because I thought, well, surely we just need to advocate with uh, Republicans because Democrats are, are supportive of Dream Act and comprehensive immigration reform, and that's not yeah. a, that's mm -hmm. not that's not the full story. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, good public policy, in, especially in this realm, has the potential to be the biggest lever that we could possibly pull, mm. and and I think that. All of, all of our efforts collectively um, to be more effective as philanthropists uh, should, be, should have a tip of the arrow. You know, I yeah. feel like we are, we are the, filling that, that's the shaft of the arrow, but the tip of the arrow is often public policy. And, and getting that right mm -hmm. and, and the amount of resources and, and um, pathways that that can help absolutely is the the highest and best use of philanthropy. Hmm. So I think that for me, I didn't always have a public policy goal in mind when I started uh, in in the philanthropic sector, and now we do. Yeah, that's great. Hmm. Let's um, take some questions from the sure. audience. Um, so uh, we will now open up uh, the floor uh, uh, for a little while. Uh, to questions from the audience. We've got mics, I think, roaming, and uh, whoever has a question, if you could um, just say your name and where you're from and, and your question, that would be great. Gene Cochran from Charlotte, North Carolina. Could you talk a little bit about when you have the children ready to go to college, how do the colleges respond to their uh, enrollment, but also supporting them while they're in school? Well, it really does vary by, by type of school. But in general, every college wants students who are going to be successful. The colleges suffer as much as the individual when students do not complete college. And across our country, we have 50% <coughs> college completion within six years of four-year colleges. That's not good for anyone, and certainly not for the institutions. So, so our students, because they get supported all the way through college, uh, ha are really great students for colleges to accept. Um, our, our students have 75% uh, 
completion rate in six years, which is above the national average for all students and uh, triple the national average for first generation low income students in college. Uh, and and it's, it's really all about, you know, the, the two biggest predictors for college completion are the ability to do the work and the ability to pay. So if, if we can take care of those two big chunks in partnership with the colleges and universities, then I think we can, I mean, we could get really, really good outcomes. And I think that colleges are starting to look at, at the kind of supports that are needed um, that are slightly different for first generation college bound mm -hmm. students and starting, and we've seen a lot of colleges change their support systems and their scaffolding for first generation college bound students. Can you give us an example of what are the different supports, Lori? Um, well, certainly, so, so the ability to do the work. Mm -hmm. So some students come in needing remediation right. and that's not identified right away. So identifying that early, taking care of it in the summer leading up to mm -hmm. it, having, having summer bridge programs are all mm -hmm. very effective strategies. Also, for students who need remediation, the college completion rate is so very, very low for, for a number of reasons, but one of them is your financial aid packages are for four years in a four-year university. If you need remediation, you're immediately looking at longer than four years, usually five years and sometimes six years. And so what we found is that we often see students not complete college in year three or four mm. because they had a six-year trajectory and they had four years of funding. Yeah. Other questions? So uh, my name is Gail Ober, and I'm the executive director of the George Family Foundation in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And we also fund college preparation and college support programs. Have you ever thought about convening all of them? Because I think you're all trying to do the same thing, but I suspect you all tackle it a little differently. And maybe we could have more success getting students through college, mm -hmm. as you describe, if you got everybody together. Just a thought. That's always a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing bad about that idea. Um, there are a couple of conveners. New Profit, if you're familiar with them, uh, has recently, over the last two years, convened uh, actors in the college completion space. Um, they're, they're now, now more, more organizations are focusing on it, so the convenings um, are happening more and more frequently. But I think, in general, in, in social change philanthropy, the people, people often operate in silos and there isn't enough information sharing in general and so those kind of convenings can be very high leverage. Next question. Yeah. Sylvia. Hi, I'm Sylvia Yee with the Evelyn and Walter Haas Jr. Fund and I really want to thank you for helping to um, help us understand the issues of families who are living in the shadows and how important it is that um, there be some resolution for the huge numbers of families and kids who are undocumented. So the question I had for you is, your lesson was around the need for good public policy. And I wanted to understand a little better, um, because we have been funding in this area for quite a long mm -hmm. time as well, how you think about funding good public policy particularly um, if there is a C4 lobbying strategy, because you as an individual uh, can also do that, and how that tracks with the C4 way, that, the C3 way that you think about funding public mm. policy. Um, well, for me personally, Sylvia, we, I, with, uh, with my partners have have um, a slightly different format at Emerson Collective. We have, we, we're rather agnostic about the form that capital can take. And so we can, we have a series of LLCs. We can invest in for-profit entities. We can do grant making to nonprofit entities. We can engage in lobbying and advocacy through C4s. And we can, we can have political spend, direct political spends through direct contributions to candidates, impacts, et cetera. So, so we look at it as a suite of, of, of methodologies 
that we surround the problem with. In addition to that, um, we have cross-cutting media strategies, communication strategies, and, and policy strategies that can be used at the municipal and state uh, levels as well as the federal level. So in the case of um, immigration reform, obviously the big, big lever is, is federal policy. But there are a lot of mitigations that can be done at the state and municipal level. And so we're just, we're starting to focus on that. I think this is a huge opportunity for people to take learnings from cities that, that are doing really interesting and innovative work uh, and repurposing some of their assets towards supporting those who need the support. You another question over there? Share some of the financial information with us. Uh, for example, the average cost per student that's, uh, that's supported, uh, what your primary funding streams are. It, is this um, for what entity? Do you mean for, for college, college track? track? For oh. college track, yes, thank you. Sure. Um, the, the last I saw, in general, college track spends $5,000 per student per year in high school. and and slightly more in college because we put together financial packages for every student. And so obviously for the undocumented students, um, their, their financial need is much higher than for those who aren't. Uh, so it's about, I think the latest is about $6,000 per student per year through college and 5,000 per student per year in high school. So if you're in three years of work in high school, that would like $15,000 to the point where they enter college. Am I understanding that right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. So I'm going to uh, just do a follow up before we take another question from the audience about the Emerson Collective, because it is an unorthodox vehicle. That you've Slightly. Created. Although, I, I mean, there are others in this space who, who we look to who have different constructs, who have yeah. a kind of. So the Skoll Foundation has, uh -huh. has multiple constructs in the same way. Right. Omidyar Foundation, or the Omidyar Network has a network of, of different vehicles. Uh, so I think, I think actually a lot, of, a, a lot of people are thinking about you know, the nimbleness and flexibility of vehicles more and more rather than a straight up foundation. Yeah. Right now we don't have a, a foundation as part of Emerson Collective, but as we grow, I can imagine that we would. You yeah. know, I, we want to be. We want to. Obviously, we want to be as smart about deploying resources as possible. Yeah. Um, at the same time, we we want to be nimble and opportunistic. If if we see something that we can affect, mm -hmm. that we want to do right away. Yeah. Is most of your funding now to C3s, or uh, is it sort of evenly distributed between C3s, C4s? Political Probably, yes, most is, yes, most is to C3s. It's, uh -huh. it's dynamic because we do have all, uh, we have a lot of other avenues, but um, yeah, most is to C3s, uh -huh. yes. I think grant making definitely is, is the largest chunk. Yeah. Um, but in the education space, we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of for-profit entrepreneurs, for example, in the ed tech space, and that's exciting, so yeah. I hope that grows. Great. Yeah. Another question. Hi, I'm Claire Solot, and I have both a thank you and an invitation. <laughs> Our foundation <Awesome. laughs> does um, funding and legal services here in California, and so my thank you is for raising the issue. I think mm -hmm. that it's a very under-appreciated um, area in terms of the impact that it can have on a myriad of issues. And the invitation is that we recently formed a legal service funder network here in the Bay Area. So we would love to invite you to join us and anyone else Thank who's you. interested. <laughs> um, and I have um, a wealth of knowledge and resources on things that range from things like local justice buses that do the kind of work that you talked about in the field to all sorts of issues. So anyone who would like to chat with me later, feel free to come find me. Thank you. Well, any more invitations? That's great. <laughs> I like that. <coughs> Terrific. Well, so everybody else can hear you. Uh, so, everybody else. <laughs> so, 
say who you are. I'm Allison Holmes from the Annenberg Foundation in Los Angeles, and I'd love to hear more whether you have office, an actual office in LA, um, but I can, I can sort of look that up. But I was curious more <laughs> about um, the, you know, the, the child and parent pipeline and how, um, for how, how much longer is DACA in existence? I mean, when does it have to be re-upped? And even though the parent uh, piece of legislation is in litigation, you said, is there, is there any outlet or avenue for funders to help that move forward? Um, well, so DACA has been re-upped. 2015 was the re-up. Um, and, and we're all, but there's also a huge backlog uh, for new DACA recipients that, that's being held up, although that, that's expected to be addressed. For the parents of DREAMers, uh, I think we're, we're waiting, this has been pushed out to the fall, and it's in the Fifth Circuit, which is, has uh, two very, very conservative judges, and so um, people are not optimistic about that. In Los Angeles, your fine mayor, Mayor Garcetti, has, has repurposed libraries and librarians and has trained 10,000 librarians in the kind of the rudimentary aspects of immigration law. And so they can give people advice and guidance as to how to apply for DACA. And it's been extraordinarily successful. Um, he also has, has staffed his Office of Immigrant Affairs with some, an incredibly capable person. And so there, this, you live in a fine city for immigrants, and if I were you, I would ask the mayor directly where they need scaffolding and support. It could be around programs but it, and legal services, or it could be around communication in communities. And College Track does have a Boyle Heights um, Center, and then we just opened up in Jordan Downs in Watts. Yeah. I think we'll take question. one more. One more question. Uh, I'm Jill Blair. And I, I, um, I wonder what your public policy play is in high school education. Um, well, we do. We have a very small policy team in Washington that's been advising um, in Congress as Congress is debating ESEA reauthorization. And so, we could give you sort of our, our policy guidelines. In general, um, we were very disappointed that overall the accountability framework for K-12 has been largely eroded. Um, we feel strongly that, that we need, that, that the illumination that was given to us through NCLB actually should, should remain, and we need to understand what students are learning um, how, how resources are deployed, what are the outcomes of, of 12 or 13 years of schooling, how, is it, how does it differ from zip code to zip code. These are kind of things we as a country really need to know, and a lot, and a lot of that framework has been eroded in, this, in the latest reauthorization, and that's really disappointing. Also, the, the butchering of Common Core uh, has been rather tragic. So, Laureen, the Emerson Collective is named for Ralph Waldo Emerson. It is, yeah. Right? Uh, so, how did you come to name it right. for him? Tell us so that. So, this is the one question that she told me that she was going to ask. So, <laughs> that's why I have my phone, because I came, I came equipped with a quote. Um, and I, know, I know you're going to ask me for my favorite quote. But yeah. in general, um, I th personally, I'm really compelled by, um, by his essay on self-reliance, but also in general, the whole transcendental movement um, it speaks to, to my core values and what I think is important in life, which is all about transcending limits and, and, and you believing in the self and investing in the self to overcome limits and conditions that, that you inherit when you're born and questioning, questioning structures, questioning systems, and, and working to improve them at the same time. Mm. So I admire him and his thinking greatly. Uh, and, and, uh, and so and, you and were gonna ask me about my favorite, favorite quote. quote. <laughs> um, so there's so many great Emerson quotes. There are. And, and many of them have been repurposed by others. 
Um, I used to think that Eleanor Roosevelt was the one who said, you must do that which you are most afraid to do, but she actually took that from Emerson. <laughs> <laughs> so I used to credit her. So that's one of my favorite quotes, um, and it's just, for me, I find it motivating personally uh, to, keep, to keep pushing myself um, and not to ever be static and not to ever uh, think that I'm done. Yeah. Um, but I do have another quote that I'm going to read to you because I looked at it. I had such a long car ride up here. So <laughs> here's one. Here's one for today uh, that speaks to me. The purpose of life is not to be happy. It is to be useful, to be honorable, to be compassionate, to have it make some difference that you have lived and lived well. Mm, thank you. Thank you.